One of the aspects of human capital that I think is important is that unlike physical capital that might be at the workplace, you take your human capital home with you when you go home at night. Right. So if we have a policy change or other change that changes people's attitudes about obtaining human capital for the workplace, that's going to spill over to the household. That's going to change the outcomes for their children and outcomes in the household oh, generally. Sure. And you and I were talking earlier about this and how that fits into some of the debate about how we might address inequality. So for example, one way we could try to address rising inequality, which both you and I would agree, at least when it comes to earnings and income between high and low skilled, there's been a widening gap. And so one answer is, well, let's just take money away from these guys <laughs> and give it to those guys. Right. And that'll solve the problem and we're done. And, you know, we're back to where we were because we've narrowed the income gap back to its old place. I think a human capital perspective would say, well, wait a minute. Have you really done what you think you've done, or is you, have you even made things better? I mean, maybe we should talk about that a little bit. Well, that's a huge question you're raising. It has multiple aspects, and it probably isn't just a human capital question. It's an incentive question. Just because literally, I mean, I think this is the way we attacked poverty 50 years ago in this country. When Johnson started the war on poverty, everybody said we, and Johnson was an idealist in his own way. He really wanted to have poverty ended in his, in his lifetime. He tried everything, job training programs, affirmative action programs, Head Start, he just a shotgun approach. But, what, and, but a huge amount was transfers, just income transfers. And what people didn't recognize at the time was the effects of these transfers and the effect of kind of creating two cultures and not giving people incentives to engage with a larger society. So I think it was like a, and this is still a common notion, somehow that we want to redistribute from the rich to the poor. Now, you may want to redistribute. There's a whole argument for progressive taxation, and I think that's classical and it's got its issues. But I think what we also want to do, even the modern argument about redistribution respects incentives. And, and usually incentives only for capital. But here we also want to think about expanding incentives for human capital and for people to engage in the rest of society. So I think the one thing we learned about 50 years ago and the last 30 years, uh, we've, 20 years we've been acting on it, is if you create two populations, one that's kind of just outside the mainstream and just kind of festering on itself versus a, a population that kind of gets integrated into the workplace and gets, it's, everybody's treated alike. You help make your own way. You do the best you can. So an integrated policy that incentivizes people to engage in a larger society, which has incentives, which builds human capital, I think is far more effective than a policy that's actually going to kind of say, oh, we're going to transfer from the rich to the poor and then create a whole community of uh, slums and so forth. That was tried. I mean, you go to Edinburgh today and in Scotland and you come to this ruined area, they're rebuilding it now, but for 50 years they literally built this whole set of welfare projects they took people out of what essentially areas near where the jobs were and the docks were, put them on the dole, and created a society that everybody, including the members of that society, thought was a very terrible society. And we've moved against that in American social policy. That's broader than you were aiming at, but I think that's, it's part of the question of giving people incentives, and skills are the way to give people incentives. So I can give you a check, but that's telling you two things. You're not good enough to work, you know, you're not in, in here. You you go home. I, you, dignity will be measured by the paycheck I give you, but not by your engagement in the larger society. I think we've learned that's important, and it's also important for building skills on the job training and just staying integrated. So there are a bunch of questions. I'm not sure you wanted to go in all those directions. No, I think that's <laughs> critical because I think, you know, even if we ended up with the same narrowing of the income distribution. Let's assume yeah. we, we bought in 100% into that idea. And I'm saying well, we could buy into that 100%. How we got there is going to be really important because the effect on all these other aspects of life that you talked about before yes. is going to be different. Correct. 
because if I got there by building people's human capital, let's say I took them from 10,000 a year to $15,000 a year by either giving them a check or I did it by building their human capital. Those two cases are going to be really different because when I got him to 15 by building his human capital, he's going to have all these other benefits from that human capital not, that aren't just earnings. Right. That is household, crime, exactly. drug addiction. His kids are going to be more engaged with the school, more engaged with working themselves. Exactly. Tons of advantages. Well, this takes us back to this, just for example, the crime example you were mentioning. There's a paper by Lochner and Moretti that was published in the American Economic Review some 10 years ago, and they were looking directly at what would be the benefit of promoting increasing high school education in terms of reducing crime, huge benefits. Then, like good economists, they said, well, how, what about alternative policies and putting more police on the beat? Well, that'll also reduce crime. But it was far more expensive than it was to actually just promote education. High school degrees are really important for reducing crime. And I think the psychologists now are moving in that direction. The idea is that we can motivate people to think that they can actually do something with themselves and achieve something. There's a woman who's a psychologist. Her name is Carol Dweck. I don't know if you've heard about her. But she's, what she's talking about is, and she claims to make a difference. She has limited interventions. But if children are taught to think that they have like limited ability and it's genetic and they can't do anything, then they typically are less incentivized. Her strategy is to say, no, the mind is a muscle, you can learn and do it. So by incentivizing children, she's claiming to find substantial test scores. That's an example. I think it's interesting, the psychologists who move that route, they really see that incentivizing people in certain ways. So I don't want to endorse her program or attack it, but I think it's a common sense idea. And it takes you even outside of what's considered standard economics. But I think it's a public economics. If we engage people in the larger society, it's not a question of, us versus them. It's a question of all of us are kind of engaged in a common enterprise. And I think the human capital is the way for building that common framework where it integrates people in society. But I think the policy that actually is promoting, promoting people's engagement and skills, even from the beginning of life, I think that's got to be the most effective policy. It's, it's dignified. It's not, this is not a hard-nosed economist saying, you know, we're putting a dollar figure on lives. No, it's actually saying we're trying, to, we're trying to give dignity to everybody's life. I think that's what human capital does, skills more generally.